Good evening, everyone. It's Shamila Ramjawan coming to you from the Red Corner. And today we speak to the warrior queen and a survivor, Lynn Hill. Hello, Lynn. Hi there. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Looking as gorgeous as ever. I thought I'd match the wall, darling. I thought I'd match the theme of the show. And so I decided on red again. <laughs> that is amazing. Well done. Well, I, today I'm matching the plant. <laughs> All good. Hashtag balance. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, I'm, I'm sure everybody wants to know who is Lynn. So do you want to maybe tell us something about Lynn Hill? Well, she loves to inspire and she loves to use every single medium and mechanism possible to do that. Um, she does it through the art of speaking and writing, um, but she's also a dog lover. She's also a horse lover. She loves to cook and she loves to bake. Um, she's a mom of two beautiful, I wanted to say babies. Um, the one baby's 33 and the other's 26. So I guess a mom of two beautiful, um, functional, self-sustaining adults. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I'm blessed. Wow, that's amazing. So how do you actually be so young? I follow your footsteps. I follow your example. <laughs> Um, I think you are a, a few years my senior. <laughs> lots of water, lots of exercise um, and loving life. I think loving life and passion and, and, and doing what makes your heart sing and your soul happy. Um, I think that that really is, is rejuvenating in itself. Yeah. I think just believing in yourself is the road to success. Absolutely. And if we don't do it for ourselves, Shamila, no one's going to do it for us. And um, I think, you know, the sooner young women can get to understand that, um, the better. That at the end of the day, your greatest resource is your inner resource. And that is self and passion and vision and, and the will to want to, the will to want to succeed, the will to want to triumph over adversity. So absolutely, yeah. So Lynn, the warrior woman that I know, the survivor, do you wanna take us through the trauma that you went through with rape and violation? The first was so brutal that you crossed over but didn't die. Do you wanna maybe just tell us a little bit about that? Um, the first rape, happened when I was only 15 years old. I was raped by someone who belonged to my church. Um, the brutality was of such that the police thought a train had ridden over my face. And yes, I was tortured for 45 minutes to a point that I lost consciousness, crossed over. And then um, I guess it was divinely decided that um, my mission, my earthly mission um, was not yet fulfilled. And so um, that was really, I think, a defining moment um, in, in, in really articulating a trajectory that would become inspirational. Um, you know, I'm often asked, how did you manage to go through all of that and still reach a level of triumph? And just in, in prep mode for a radio interview this morning, it was not the triumph and it's, it's not my achievements. I think that now is just a byproduct of purpose. I just relentlessly and doggedly pursued against all odds a purpose that was placed inside of me and I believe that I was not spared from death simply to tell the story um, and rehash the story I think it was really to share the lessons against which this context and and, and the lessons that led me to transcend um, from victimhood to victory and, and that is my purpose. And that I've done consistently for so many years, not always sharing my story. I didn't share it in my unhealed state. It took me many, many years to kind of just be a trainer 
um, and a speaker without touching on my story because I never wanted my story to become a reason for my professional credibility. I wanted my professional credibility first. And I owned that with all of my heart. And somehow the timing was perfect that when I had owned that, I was also sufficiently healed. Um, and, and that is when I started to share my story. Yeah. That is, you know, when I hear stories like this, I'm lost for words because um, look at your journey, you know, how far you've come and um, what you've accomplished. I think that is incredible and uh, well done to you. Do you want to maybe I take us? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. You can go. No, I was, I was just going to say, Sharmila, that um, as much as, as I've worked towards the triumph and I have doggedly pursued my purpose, I sit here this evening as a representation of so many women who need to be honored um, for their strength, who never get a chance to be interviewed, who have gone through hell um, 10,000 times more than, than I have. And there are those women. Um, and, and so I sit in the space really representing them. Thank you for that. You know, I've created this platform for women like yourself to come forth and share stories with the rest of the world, because I think it's so important, you know, you could make such an impact on someone's life by just sharing your story. So Lynn, uh, oh. redefinition, rescripting, demystification are key for both men and women. Why do you think so? And when must the start? I think um, one of the, you know, the notion of um, gender-based violence as, and, and just looking at it in isolation, um, there's, there's such a misperception about it because I believe gender-based violence is really an effect of something. So gender-based violence really becomes an effect of a root cause. And I identify that root cause as the absolute misconstrual of supremacy and power based on gender or an entitlement that is basically linked um, to a gender. And um, for me, really, the, de the, 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 the first demystification is what is power, um, that we need to begin to redefine authentic power top down and bottom up. Um, and that in that we, in, in the redefinition of, of power, we need to also ask ourselves, where does this misconstrual start? Um, is this misconstrual, does it start when we bring up little boys and little girls and we overemphasize gender roles rather than authentic identity? Um, you know, I, and of course, there's some religious notions linked to power. Um, one of the favorite biblical texts is wives submit to your husbands. And that really has been so misconstrued, so abused over the years. And the, the verse that actually follows that is treat your wife as you would treat the church. Um, and, and that's really love her as you would love God. And so I think the rescripting would be power. The redefinition is power. Um, as, as much as, as boys need to be rescripted, and even adults require rescripting, um, Shamila, in order to become more conscious individuals, we need to look at the aspects that we are, even in unconscious ways, perpetuating um, how we what we allow our boy children to do in the house, what we are expecting our girl children to do in the house. Are we modeling as parents the kind of behavior um, that is going to um, impact another generation? Because if we don't become more conscious in our parenting, if we don't become more conscious in how we are schooling um, and what we are doing across various systems, and we'll get to correctional services later, if we don't do that, we basically perpetuating um, the very things that we are wanting to change and so we need to ask ourselves what are we starting to 
what have we normalized in terms of tolerance, in terms of how we are treated as women, in terms of how we treat our children, in terms of what we allow in our homes, what we allow in our schools, because somehow there's been a normalization of, of negative patterns and that has led to a culture of tolerance. Very, very interesting. So I'm trying to picture this, Lynn, a 16 year old in a Supreme Court, one of the highest courts that you find. How did that feel? Um, it, it, was, it was another form of a nightmare. So the nightmare happened, the rape happened, um, and obviously not knowing the term secondary victimization um, at, at the age of 16, but needing to defend myself, needing to defend my courage, having the very courage that it took to get to that court 10 months after he had been let out on bail. Um, uh, it was it was an absolute nightmare in fact i was interrogated i felt like i had perpetrated i felt like i had wronged someone because the level of interrogation that came at me from his prosecution was what kind of 16 year old dreams this up um what kind of 16 year old with an imagination and obviously as articulate as you are he said um is so sick to have journaled lies because I'd kept a journal. And, and that was the level of bashing after uh, 10 months of living in fear. So I was raped on the 1st of January. Um, when I came out of sedation, he came out on bail of 500 Rand. Um, <laughs> you know, you're shaking your head, Shamila. But two weeks ago, we had a, 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 a muso um, who, is, who was a mentor, and he was accused of rape in Cape Town. Uh, for years, he had raped, allegedly raped a boy. And he comes out, and it was 20, it's 28 years later, but he comes out on a thousand rand bail. And I ask myself, if in 28 years, in a democratic, now democratic South Africa, has the bail increased only by 500? So there was the bail, there was the individual living in the same community. Um, the first court case was the 15th of, uh, not my birthday, July. And the, when they saw the photos, it went then went from regional to supreme because the charge then became an attempted rape charge based on what my face had looked like. But in that Supreme Court, I also stood there on behalf of others who had been raped by allegedly the same individual in my church, girls who didn't report it. So we were dealing with a serial rapist. I was about the fourth victim. And even in that, in, in that moment, I knew I was speaking out and up for those who did not have the courage to, and I believed in, in, in some weird way that I was chosen to do that, and I did that. But the bashing that I received in court and my need to defend why I was defending myself, I think that was absolutely horrific. That was an extension of a nightmare, um, and, and it's time to change that, yeah. So change. What do you think still needs to be done in terms of the victim in South Africa? Oh my gosh, there's, um, we haven't touched the tip of the iceberg. Um, if I can just go back to when I was drug raped and that was only two years ago, um, I was refused help at Morningside Police Station. So we are speaking how many years later, we are speaking of after Ramaphosa makes um, uh, one of his speeches where he, he says there are now two pandemics, the one is COVID and the other is gender-based violence. But two or three days after he says that, a victim gets turned away from Kayalicha police station. So what is it that we need to change? We need to really seriously look at who are the stakeholders at stake here. Um, SAPS needs empowerment <laughs> as SAPS. Um, you know, correctional services needs empowerment in terms of sentences are not rehabilitative mechanisms. A sentence is a punitive mechanism. We've seen how a rapist who has come out in an unrehabilitated form um, 
murdered Nene, he murdered the UCT student. So we need to look at rehabilitation seriously. Um, we need to look at sentencing. We need to look at bail, um, bail applications. What happens when the individual on bail comes out to the very community in which the victim lives? We need to look at when uh, two years ago, uh, I was treated for shock at, at Four Ways Medi Clinic. Um, my blood pressure, my heart rate, so I was literally in shock um, still 24 hours later, but there was no rape kit at the hospital. So there's no rape kit. You get pushed away out of a police station while you are still um, totally disorientated. And that is when the victim says, stuff this. Um, you know, why do I need to go through this? And so we have not touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of effecting um, a, a road that, that is so much more humane for that victim. Why is it that there are no rape kits at hospitals? Why is it that the very place where there is a rape kit, you actually get turned away from? Beyond that experience, I found out that there's something called a skeleton um, document that you can go to any police station. You don't need to go, um, you know, in the region. So there is just so, so much that still needs to be done. And treating the symptoms treating the stats on gender-based violence, um, creating more safe houses, that does not speak to the sustainable solution. If we create more safe houses, we also need to create economic, empowering opportunities for these women. We want women to speak out, but once they speak out, then what? How safe are they? Um, and once they are safe in a safe house, why is it that they're only given the option of beading or doing something that speaks to entrepreneurial development? Every human soul has wings and was born to fly. And I believe that if we are not economically empowering victims of sexual violence and abuse, we are not, we are not empowering them at all because counseling is psychologically empowering but it is not economically sustainable. And we need to create moments where economic sustainability and psychological empowerment are really going to intersect. Um, how else do you change a woman's life? Women stay in those situations because that perpetrator, if it's, if it's domestic violence, he would have created um, a, a context where she feels defenseless, where she feels powerless. And, um, you know, just reporting it in the absence of a support system, in the absence of a job, um, that's not going to create change for her. In pretty much the same way as if we if we don't change prison sentencing, if we don't change bail, if we don't look at it from a correctional services perspective, um, why why would victims want to report? And so we really, really as a nation need to get so so serious um, about the root cause of this thing and addressing it, and 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 we need to become absolutely cognizant of what we are prepared as a nation to continue to tolerate. Um, yeah. I just want to go back a little bit because you mentioned that when you had the second incident, you went to Morningside Police Station and they couldn't help you. Take me back yeah. on that. Why couldn't they help you? I can't understand that. In fact, um, in fact, I was I was saved by a group of women because I was dumped in a parking lot, and um, I was obviously um, still pretty much out of it. And uh, I was saved by a group of women who came across me, and um, they actually, you know, they took over and and literally rescued me. And they took me to the police station and the police, in fact, these women, um, by that time, I asked them to Google me. Um, they had smelt my breath, which was not reeking of alcohol. They had identified that I was drug raped. They were crying, literally crying for me. And they took me um, to the police station. And um, the one officer, apparently, you know, he just he just looked at me and he said, she's too intoxicated uh, to be to be helped. And um, they begged him. They cried. They begged him. 
And um, eventually they just walked away. They walked away, scooped me up and walked away. And um, I just never had, who wanted to go back um, and for what? And uh, on top of that, obviously, was, was, was Four Ways Medi Clinic that doesn't have a rape kit. Um, and you combine two of those components, you combine that, plus a woman who is in shock, um, whose heartbeat is irregular, whose blood pressure is rocketing to a point of stroke. Um, and, and that was that. And I just needed to maintain sanity. I had three deadlines to meet. I was in Joburg on a business trip. We had lunch that afternoon. Um, I only told her two weeks ago. Um, and I had three deadlines in Johannesburg. I had my media deadline. I was covering 17 newspaper titles. I had a woman of um, Impact Speaker Bureau premier speaking launch on the Wednesday. And on the Friday, I had a television interview. And I told myself that I could only feel after I had done all of that um yeah and i did with god's grace i actually did um i was yeah i was in shock um i was going through involuntary panic and, and anxiety for about 30 days after that and i stayed in johannesburg for that entire duration um i did not want my parents to see me in the state that i was nor my children so wait a minute so you've just been raped you have deadlines to meet and you get on working with it with whatever you needed to do lynn you are a warrior woman um i think for me it was really what i did at at 16 or at 15 i did that very moment and at 16 or 15 it took me a few months to get there but when I got what I was supposed to get, that the intention of this violation was to disempower my mission on this earth, I used every bit of reserve strength that was left in my shocked state. And I decided that no second rape, nobody and no one and no intention, no sabotaging intention that was behind this, was ever going to get in the way of my earthly mission which was not yet fulfilled and today just on the radio interview i used a mantra and it was um it was pain amplified purpose magnified and so as i went through that pain which was amplified um, the only sense I could make of that is that my purpose on this earth and my calling in that moment was was magnified. That was the only sense. I was, there was nothing about me that was cheap. There was nothing about me that was um, impure. In fact, the irony on both counts, 15 and 51, was that with 51, I was saving myself for my future husband. And, 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 you know, that was the question to God. How possibly again will I be chosen in the purity that I embody to go through this? Um, and the only sense was for moments such as the Shamila. Wow. You know, I, I'm trying to visualize this, not just once but twice and i'm trying to associate the trauma around all of this and you've come out so strong so you have this vision of working with correctional services what do you have in mind well COVID has had me have all of this time to come up with um, a few creative things of which correctional services was one <laughs> And it was really, you know, um, particularly looking at gender-based violence um, during COVID, the fact that it increased, the fact that there's a causal effect um, between um, the, the um, abuse of alcohol and gender-based violence, but really then saying, okay, the only way that we're going to deal with this as a nation um, is to look at it systemically. And I think, um, you know, on a day it was, 
what can what can I do? How do I? Because right now I've inspired. I've written the book. Um, which was never, ever only going to be for bookshelves. In fact, when I wrote the book, I knew I wanted the book to land in the hands of rapists. I knew I wanted correctional services to buy in um, to either having it in their libraries or utilizing it in, in conjunction with. And I came up in COVID with um, a program called From Rapist to Role Model. And I think my ability and my willingness to now step in, roll up my sleeves, go in and share my poetry, share my experiences um, with rapists um, is I think my highest expression of forgiveness and release. Um, I also believe that every single human being has the capacity to ident to in fact um, assume an identity huger than their worst last mistake. And I do believe that a rehabilitated rapist would have the capacity, and if he buys into wanting to become that community leader once he gets out of prison, um, he has the capacity to be an influencer of note in his community. He really would become an embodiment of the law of cause and effect. And he would be able to say, this was who I was. This was why I made the mistake. And this is why I'm telling you not to go the same route. And I think that, you know, if we can, if I can get that right, I think then... I'd actually smile at legacy because I'd want that to live on. Um, and, and yeah, so. I'm in awe. Here, a woman gets raped multiple times and she now basically has forgiven the rapist because now you want to go into the prisons and educate them and talk to them about rape and rehabilitation. I'm absolutely in awe. Lynn, I have no words to say. I mean, you are such an incredible human being. I guess for me, it's really, um, it's really, you know, it's the sense of me making, <laughs> making sense of why I, why I didn't die on two counts. On the first count, it was brutalization and torture for 45 minutes. On the second count, it was seven hours of my life unaccounted for. And in that seven hours, I could have been trafficked. Um, in that seven hours, and I believe I must have been dosed and overdosed and dosed again um, for me to be out for seven hours. Um, but I am living, and I believe I'm living for a reason, not just far greater than my dying now, but right now I'm living for a reason far greater than simply inspiring at conferences um, and simply writing more books. Yes, they are there and, and they're waiting. Um, and I think rolling up my sleeves, going into prisons and, and helping them redefine what power is, is really part, um, an integral part of the systemic solution. What happens if we don't do that? Um, where is the reparation going to be? What happens in the absence of really, truly focusing on rehabilitation? Um, we will continue to treat the effects and not the root cause. And the root cause is a misconstrual, which happens even in prisons. You know, rape is, is a, it's, it's a mechanism of power. And I, if I can change the narrative of power in a prison, then I can change the narrative of power anywhere. So I, I would say I would call rape a toxic violence or toxic abuse because we know in South Africa the stats, one in three women are either physically or sexually abused. What would you, you've been through the trauma, what would you say uh, is the root cause of the problem? Why do they actually do that? Um, so 
from a psychological perspective, you know, you, you get psychopathy, and obviously that is that is a level um, beyond rehabilitation, uh, where there's chemical imbalance, where um, medication is required. If I look at my my particular um, uh, the 15, what happened to me at 15, and how only 23 years after that happened, I was 38 when I wrote a poem. And strangely, how I'm coming full circle with correctional services, because I was asked to be part of a prison project um, at 38. I didn't tell a soul. I said yes without thinking it through. And after I said yes, it was, oh God, what have I done? Um, I'm not ready. And um, divine instruction was write a poem, write a poem and call it the rape. And I wrote that poem. Um, and after I wrote it, and I wrote it in preparation for my healing to step into Paul's more prison and meet the head of the 28s and meet the head of the 26s, because that was part of the project. And I wrote the poem with the vividity as if it had happened and the sensory acuity as if it had happened three, four days ago. And I relived it. And it was, it was, it was, it was brutal. Um, and when I actually read and reread the poem, I came to the realization, and that was my breakthrough. It was my breakthrough just there. And I was reading John Demartini's breakthrough experience at that very time. And my breakthrough was, um, this was never about me, you know, and, and, and the two lines of, in that poem um, was you called them whore, bitch, and motherfucker, um, alien words to a virginal brain. And what, what that poem did for me was it actually made me understand that it was never about me, that those names that he was calling, in my recalling that, he was alluding to his mother and his sister. So I became an object of his displaced anger. I became an object of unprocessed anger. And when I came to terms and I was able to objectify that experience, what that did for me was it actually had me then stand in a space of freedom and magic for the first time to say it was never about me. And I think when any victim, whether it's gender-based violence or sexual trauma, can get to a point and say, oh my God, it truly was not about me you were damaged and I was whole. And for 23 years, I got it so wrong. And that poem really um, was my, my ticket to release. And guess what? The prison project never happened, but it was heaven's way, heaven's mysterious way, I think, of healing me um, because I had been, by that time, I'd been through too much suffering and it was now time to just breathe and, and to release. And strangely, when I released, given that experience with John Demartini's quantum collapse process, which says even if you have not, um, you know, even if you've not uh, uh, raped someone, what is the principle that you're judging? And the principle I was judging was violation because I had been violated. And um, his neutralization of the judgment is, when have you ever violated anybody? So the very thing that you're judging, when were you guilty of that? And my response at that moment was, but I've not raped. And it goes further, but how have you violated consciously or unconsciously? And I was 38 years old, so yes. Yes, I'd unconsciously and emotionally violated others, I'm sure. And there were moments when I had lashed back in anger um, in various contexts in my life. So yes, I had violated. Um, and when I forgave my chronic womb, bladder and tube infections, which I had endured for 25 years, for as long as all of this was happening, um, immunity to oral antibiotics um, in that that was so you never see me smile properly because my teeth were so damaged um, and then I needed crowns as a result of or oral antibiotics and I needed crowns and right now my crowns are feeling damaged and and so when I released I no longer um, 
had that sense of dis-ease. I released the dis-ease, which was my anger and my lack of forgiveness. And I have not to date experienced another bladder, whom or tube infection. And that is the power of release and forgiveness. Well done. I can see you're healthy, beautiful. Um, you have so much to share. Uh, Lynn, where can one get hold of your writings, your book, Butterfly, My Soul Got Wings? Um, I read the book, it's amazing. So where can one get hold of that? Well, for now she's available on Amazon in Kindle, hard copy or paperback. Um, we are in um, negotiation with exclusive books. Um, and then she's available in four PA stores in Cape Town, PA Johannesburg. I don't know, they're sleeping, um, but it all happens perfectly. And um, so I, and obviously, you know, uh, by virtue of, of ordering from me, um, and during COVID was this thing of it can be delivered to your door. Um, and so, yeah, for now it can be delivered to your door and hopefully um, I'm, I have a meeting tomorrow um, with uh, one of the stakeholders linked to exclusive books. So for now it's Amazon <laughs> and inbox me. <laughs> That's great. Lynn, um, your power message is Women's Month. What is your power message to the women out there? Um, my power message to women would be you will never ever be able to effect a positive change in your life without making a conscious choice. And that the quality of our choices are so inextricably linked to the value that we place on ourselves. And when we come to terms with the fact that we don't have to become queens, that we were born queens, that we have divinity running through our veins, um, when we buy into our worth, we buy into what it is that we deserve. And whatever you're doing in this moment, whatever pain you're going through or whatever you've gone through in the past, know that in any given moment you don't have to hold yourself ransom to an old choice and an old choice is as old as a minute ago new choices create new realities and as queens we were destined to live and create the most beautiful experiences for ourselves and that therefore nullifies the notion that we need a presence, a male presence in our life, however toxic, to either complete us or to create experiences for us. Step up, step into the fullness of the glory that is already within you because it's there. Step up and, and make new choices, create new realities. Never allow anybody to rob you of your dreams because in any given moment, we have a choice. Um, the mind cannot assume two mental spaces at any one point in time. And so we can't be pitiful and powerful at the same time. And that implies that in any given moment, we have a choice to be one of that. And in being one of either, in that moment, we get to disempower or empower victimhood or victory. What a powerful message. We're going to leave it at that. Lynn, I wish you everything of the best. Continue sharing and inspiring people across the globe. You have the capability of doing it. And I'm going to follow your journey. Thank you for coming on the Red Corner Chat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure.